first case of coronavirus in South Africa Another has been Since the first case of coronavirus was discovered in South Africa on the 5th of March 2020, more than 2,500,000 people have tested positive for the coronavirus and approximately 80,000 people have lost their lives. As we face the third wave of this deadly virus, the Eastern Cape Province is one of the most adversely affected. The city of Gabecha has become a ghost town where businesses that once thrived are now empty, waiting and wanting for change. On the front line of this battle against this fatal disease are doctors, nurses, medical staff and essential workers who sacrifice their time, health and lives to save others. These are some of their stories. My name is Dr. Toby Safoto. I work at um, Livingston Hospital. I am a physician, um, now qualified intensivist. I work in the ICU section and I look after the most critically ill patients in the hospital. My name is uh, Zinziswa. Limba. Professionally, I am a doctor who specializes in dermatology. Um, but uh, during the pandemic, we've been given a release uh, with our statutory body to serve uh, as uh, frontliners. Morning. So first, first thing in the morning, what we do when we get to base is we check our vehicle. We need to check our oxygen, make sure we. We've got enough oxygen for our patients. And then most important place to check our ECG machine. It's the one that uh, have a view at the heart. Also gives you a blood pressure reading, as well as a uh, saturation. My name is Danielle. I work at Godmead Ambulance Service. I'm a BAA. I work on an ambulance every day. We take patients to hospital, we pre-hospital care. So we do do treatment before we arrive at hospital. I'm Dr. Seseko Martin. I'm a clinical microbiologist uh, based in Port Elizabeth for the Pat Care Laboratories. I'm a consultant a microbiologist, meaning that I help uh, the doctors uh, with their infectious patients. Um, I'm also involved with the ward rounds, uh, clinical ward rounds, teaching ward rounds. Um, those entail um, very sick patients in ICUs and high cares, where we rotate with the doctors and doing ward rounds there. 
and I'm, I'm advising them on how to treat those patients. Mentally, with having to see a disease entity in the midst of where I work and having to see a lot of deaths, the increased rate of infection and the, the high rate of death, it, I don't have words to describe it, but I think I could use just one simple word to say uh, it, I was in disbelief. And it was quite a burden mentally. And also having to have a disease entity where the rapidness of infection um, puts us as frontliners at high risk. My name is Kanyiswa Makaba. I started working in this company since 2017. I worked in the control room as a control room supervisor, where we dispatch ambulances. We received a call from a community on Gelandoleana. It's very stressful to work in the control room because we receive a high call volume where we deal with different people, like you get Abandu Aba like very arrogant, about about very impatient, where you just need to try when I will level as a Zanzi. And at that very moment, you don't even have an ambulance available. So it's very stressful where you can't at that very, um, uh, at that very moment. My name is Odwaduhu, the founder and the director of Odwaduhu Funeral Services. Before the introduction of COVID-19, in the Lebesh Kubangayuminguabo was just a normal thing. We were only running funerals, mostly on Saturdays and Sundays. And you'll find out that Saturday we'll be conducting about 15 to 20 funerals. Then there was the introduction of COVID-19. My name is Kira Mabu. I'm a training medical scientist here at Bathby Laboratories. Um, I do the bulk of the COVID testing. Molecular is the field that I prefer. It's my, my speciality. So when all of this started, um, obviously it's, it's scary. It's something that you don't think that you would ever live through. I mean, who of us thought that we would be living through a global pandemic um, in our lifetime? It was, yeah, it was nerve wracking. And I think every medical professional will tell you the same thing. It's it's scary when you're dealing with something that we don't really know all that much about. It's new, it's deadly, it's... So there was a lot of anxiety to, to start off with and I think everybody felt like this crazy anxiety when it came to dealing with it for the first time. I mean, I can remember when the first test was done in this lab and how everybody was like so scared to even be in the same room as this thing. And when the volume started picking up, it doesn't really give you a chance to like conceptualize the fear that you're feeling or the anxiety that you're feeling and it becomes just another sample and you just got to get it out as quickly as, as you can. After kufike COVID-19, ako misebe nzi okulmendu taka na mali, asikuwa zutashe kikamba nizi nizi zi haba rechenja ban. So ili temba kutila pela ez abanda basa funu msebe. So kunzi manangoku ez ndi ofe msebe nzi but I have to go around selling a mask just because I don't have. With regards to the um, COVID um, restrictions, uh, it has just um, made us um, have to stretch the resources. So what, what hurts the most is when you have to provide very little support to somebody that you think you could have uh, provided more support because the resources have been limited. Also then, uh, you know, people end up dying because uh, we cannot provide uh, the, you know, the support. But also with COVID, you know, the degree of the, uh, the lung pathology that uh, people present with, with COVID, it seems to be 
uh, much worse than you know, the usual bacterial pneumonia that uh, people would present with, because often with those patients, we actually could pull them through um, you know, before COVID. But you know, the, the type of diseases in the lungs that comes with COVID, um, it tends to be much worse than what we normally will have to deal with. And, and therefore, we end up losing more people um, with COVID than we would have if they had just come in with the usual bacterial um, pneumonia. With COVID, we had to stop the water rounds. We had to do some of the virtual um, water rounds. So that really changed everything. Patient conduct and even in the hospitals because they were anticipating a lot of influx of these patients. They had to change or close some of the wards. They had to stop all the elective surgeries, you know, and uh, allocate those wards uh, for, for uh, COVID patients. So the whole um, uh, dynamics of uh, clinical medicine really changed. We no longer have patient contacts, so we, we consult more sitting in the office and uh, analyzing the specimen. And we also do the COVID testing in our, in our lab. So it's a huge change and from ward rounds, uh, bed, uh, bedside ward rounds, to sitting in the office and advising the doctors instead of um, looking at the patients and holistically. We were called, everybody, as funeral parlors to say, look guys, kukole ndongoku, ii COVID-19. And indlela ini za ukuba ngayo imi ngwabo, aizo ufana na landlela nita kukuba ngayo ikalini. And in the meantime, we were getting bodies, you know, we were excited to get too much bodies because we see this as a business. And we didn't know that this is going to be our danger. Especially, they are phoning us to say, we don't have adequate space to keep these bodies. Can you please keep these bodies? And you'll receive about 10, 15 bodies just to keep those bodies. It's not my bodies. Tomorrow, those bodies will go to various funeral undertakers. But now, Besiboni inflict the needs of Zimba. And when I phone other funeral guys to say, look, I don't have space, guys. Do you have enough space that you can borrow me in the Tenise? I don't do I not as it well. I'll tell you this. We ended up in Zimba saying, I fuck a good tray. We'll just lay a mat or a sail or whatever plastic. And then we place all these bodies up because of Government was giving us laws. Families are not supposed to view that body. Even if a family, if una ukuboni doba, is this the right person? The only thing that will do is to take a pic. Then we send member of a family by, via WhatsApp. You know, and then Baubone, and they will say, send back to us and say, I am going, you can proceed. You know, that was the new normal. It was a bad thing. COVID has impacted me very badly because it has destroyed lots of families. There are kids out there that doesn't have parents at this very moment. It's... It's a mental, physical exhaustion. It has really made us all the morale down because it's the same thing. Every time our control room dispatches us on that radio, it's COVID positive patient, shortness of breath, patient unable to breathe, unresponsive patient, COVID positive. It becomes draining because it's repetitive and we can only do so many things for that patient. It's oxygen, put up a line, make them comfortable. It's very frustrating and it's mentally a burnout and it affects your home life, you know, because you are exhausted when you get home. As a pandemic had really caught us off guard, um, we didn't have some of the platforms uh, that uh, we use for COVID testing. And also the fact that some of the patients were coming in the hospital without COVID, now they had to be 
pulled in uh, or cohorted with patients or with COVID. So it was all the frustration, where are you going to put the patients? Are you going to put the patient based on uh, the X-ray changes? What if it's just a, a, a normal flu? What if it's just a pneumonia? You know, so the frustration of the doctors in the front line was filtering to me personally because of the fact that they call me and say, where are the results? We sent the swab yesterday, we still... It, it, it's, not, it's not very important to them that there were no flights, you know, the fact is that. But the, 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 the very consoling thing was that they know the, the standard of our lab. They know that, I mean, we can't just be a bad lab overnight. So um, that sort of um, decreased uh, the anxiety bit, but it was very frustrating. What COVID has done, it has um, really unleashed or reminded us that, you know, we have to look into the mental aspect of things. And have I spoken to people? I've seen my colleagues, uh, you know, break down, you know, from all walks of, of, of life um, due to the COVID pandemic. And um, we have been fortunate in the hospital to have a, an in-house psychologist who um, is available on an appointment uh, basis to see either an individual or um, in a group um, just to go through the issues and then iron them out. I mean, if people need to take time off, people have been given time off and if people need to get admitted, that's also been discussed and it's, I mean, it's an available avenue to, to look into. So I think the, the managers and the management is aware of the, the situation. It's, it's quite sad because most of calls that we have received in this third wave, it's about a husband and a wife that are both COVID positive, where they end up both dying, leaving a 15 year old that can't take care of themselves. So COVID has really, really ruined lots of families. And it's such an emotional thing. I, I, I just want it to end. It's, it's very, very, very painful. It's touching, it's emotional, it's depressing. It's, it's just, it's, it's enough. It was quite a burden mentally and also having to have a disease entity where the rapidness of infection um, puts us as frontliners at high risk. Um, I might serve a purpose to serve uh, and to uh, give um, health advice and management and treatment to, to people who seek for help from me, but when then out I have to wear that mask. I'd, I'd have to draw strength from somewhere. So that strength, I managed to draw it, particularly from my family and from my colleagues who were very supportive. And uh, that strength, I also needed to draw it from what I knew I could do best in helping those who were infected and those affected by the pandemic. Everybody was afraid of this COVID-19 because we saw a lot of people dying. And even not, it's Mr. Nemizimba, Eminence, here COVID-19. But the bottom line is, we need to dress these people. We need to wash these people. And the younger land, when we do it, it's not being done by machine. And we knew in the Oba, at one stage, not since I was so late, I COVID-19 because I buried my mother on the 15th of December last year of COVID-19. I buried two of my workers. They died of COVID-19. And a lot of staff, some, they were infected of COVID-19. So, young Galando, it came to my mind. It traumatized me. And I thought, this thing is a kum, young woman COVID-19, but by luck, that and that right. So young Lendo is so to see and the Sanyanza Lega in Yogoba must be extra cautious. 
also it can affect one of my family members uma mom kakhulu and ungum do diabetic and dan so yika that ba dingam lose at the way ai fike nga yo kali covid 19 because we've lost abando ba nince kakhulu so dan so yika u lose one of my family members especially my mom Support, a, a, a very strong support structure is pivotal. A support structure that will understand your situation and will support you uh, with the moments of being in despair. Would a, a support structure that will help you get pulled out of those moments of despair. When I make reference to support structure, it could be anybody uh, it could be any form of environment where individuals are willing to support you emotionally, uh, support you mentally. It becomes very difficult when you're a doctor and you have a sick uh, baby or you have a sick child. Medicine just gets thrown out most moments. But I guess the, the emotional support then brings you back to the moment of having to do what needs to be done as a mother, which is taking care um, of the sick child, the sick husband, the sick baby. It's very nice to work in the control room where you know that sometimes I've tried to, 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 to help this person, and then that makes you feel so much better inside you like yeah at least i've done my job in a in a right way and you get ambulance there as soon as possible some of the lessons i have learned during this pandemic is to appreciate every day it is short um i've also learned that how much you miss human touch you know we are a family that god made we really are. So we hug each other low and, and we don't get to do that anymore because you can't, because it puts you at risk and the next person. What I've learned about myself, about the pandemic, is that I'm a strong person. I grew up in a family where we had a lot of support and in terms of our emotional development, and I think having had that seed planted me, uh, manifested, uh, you know, and flourished and flowered during the pandemic because I saw myself being positioned um, with a lot of challenges at work, at home, but uh, um, I came out of it and I was able to deliver or able to assist where I could, could assist efficiently and effectively. And have I wanted to quit? No, I've never really wanted to quit, so I don't see myself anywhere else. Even if I wanted to quit, you also have to consider your colleagues that you are leaving behind, because this is a war, we are all fighting this as the, as the soldiers, so if, you, if one of you leaves, then you are leaving the rest of the soldiers behind, so it's teamwork. This documentary revealed to me that my experience was not far off from the ones that have been shared. I was taken back to the moment when I was infected with the coronavirus. I was plagued by loneliness and fear, utterly hopeless as my symptoms worsened. I thought that I would die. My life was turned upside down and I knew that things would never be the same again. Even though I was plagued by such a traumatizing experience, I am standing here today as a COVID-19 survivor. I am reminded that we are living on borrowed time and that it is imperative to be grateful for what we still have. So life may not be how it used to be, but I choose to stand resilient through it all.